Buenos días, bienvenidos al foro de minería. Good morning and welcome to the um, Mining and Sustainable Development Forum of the Americas 2022. Mining and Sustainability of the Americas from IGF, IDB and CAMA. Um, algunos avisos administrativos antes de comenzar. So some housekeeping announcements. We do have interpretation into English and into Spanish. So please click on the icon at the bottom of your screen and choose your language. We also have a button for Q&As so that you can post any questions to our panelists. With this, we want to welcome Marcelino Madrigal, who is BID's um, Director of Energy, and then Greg Bradford, uh, IGF's director, and another colleague. Welcome. Thank you very much. And good morning to everyone. Good morning to everyone who's joining this Mining and Sustainable Development Forum of the Americas 2022. It is a pleasure to have this forum with the support of our colleagues and of CAMA. My greetings to all our colleagues in the mining sector who are joining here today. As we know, mining is an important uh, activity for Latin America and the Caribbean. It provides critical minerals for the uh, development like nickel, zinc, iron, etc. These are crucial for energy transition. These are important for batteries, for EVs, um, different materials for um, wind energy, etc. Sustainable mining is a challenge, but also a great opportunity for the region. If these resources not only contribute to economic prosperity, but also they help fight climate change and they also help work towards a carbon neutral economy. A greater mining um, production should be the engine for our productive focus, but we should be respectful of communities and the environment. We also have to leverage technological developments and practical applications uh, for the benefits of the communities. We do need a change of paradigm, paradigm and we also need a um, innovation so that we can work in the public and private sectors towards a sustainable mining. We also have to be able to face the challenges and catalyze the different uh, actors. In this sense, we always hope that our discussions in this forum, together with the dialogue taking place at the regional level, will contribute towards this aim. Thank you all very much. I wish you all the best success in this event today. And now I give the floor to my colleague. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, welcome everyone to the 2022 Forum on Mining and Sustainability of the Americas. Um, the IGF is very pleased to be part of this fourth forum with our partners, the Inter-American Development Bank and Kama, And we've been partnering uh, since 2018. And this forum has, has addressed the most challenging mining, issue, mining governance issues, uh, but it also provides really important input into the comma meetings. In, in 2018 in Lima, we discussed how to address social conflict in the mining sector. In 2019 in Buenos Aires, we discussed the impacts of new technologies in the mining sector. Last year in 2021, we held our first virtual forum and we looked at uh, how to build a regional agenda on critical minerals. So this year, uh, we're looking to uh, focus that theme on the opportunities the region has to supply the critical minerals for the uh, low carbon energy transition. The IGF is a, is a member driven uh, country organization. We have 80 governments that are members. And in the areas of critical minerals, we're, we're seeing kind of a, a twofold development. We see national governments and, and regional blocks of uh, advanced economies trying to secure their demand for critical minerals, particularly around the energy transition. On the other hand, we are just starting to see uh, member governments of mineral rich developing countries working together as regions uh, to take advantage of the critical minerals rush. 
So although countries in these regions differ on the size of their mining sectors, differ on the size of their economies, their levels of development and industrialization, this is not present, preventing them from working together and setting common goals, adding value to their mineral resources, and then also identifying uh, mineral recycling opportunities. So the question is, where does the Americas region fit in this, in this global uh, phenomenon, these, these global activities? And how can countries as a region, uh, as well as as region, optimize the demand for the critical minerals? As we just heard, the, the, the transition to the low carbon economy will be incredibly mineral intensive. So we should also have a conversation about which initiatives are worth doing together. So how can we work together to uh, achieve greater outcomes. So uh, on behalf of the IGF, I really hope that this forum inspires concrete steps and policy decisions to significantly boost the American economies through further regional integration, which is absolutely essential. So the IGF continues to support its members in, in, in this initiative. We're very proud partners with Kama and IDB, and we'll continue to strive to promote sustainable development in the mining sector. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a great forum. Marina, back to you. Muchas gracias, Marcelino. Muchas gracias, Greg. Thank you very much, Marcelino. Thank you very much, Greg. So now we give the floor to Ubaldo Usua, who is the uh, director of director partner of Karungen, and he's also going to be a facilitator for this forum. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Marina. Good morning to some of you. Good afternoon to some others. My presentation will take around 15 minutes. And then after that, we will have an interesting panel where we're going to be touching on the topics that I will be discussing in my presentation. Anyone who wants to make questions, please use the chat function or the Q&A button. There you can write down your questions and then we will be able to read them at the end of the forum. In the next 15 minutes, I want to talk to you about the basically central elements for sustainability in the region. I'm talking about Latin America. In this way, they can become a relevant source of critical minerals. And we can also optimize mining for critical minerals so that we can make a leap in this um, sector, not only for the mining operations, but also for sustainability, which is something relevant uh, for everyone. Now, first of all, let's see which are the critical minerals that are so much spoken about. There is no consensus at the global level as to what are critical minerals, but we do have criteria to establish what is considered when we're talking about critical minerals. The first one is that they're crucial for energy transition. For instance, any um, minerals that are needed for electric cars or electric mobility. We can see this uh, in the slide. In order to move towards electric mobility, we will need more copper. Copper, Without copper, as we can see here in the slide, we would be struggling to actually make this transition into electromobility. They're also related to power generation. They also need copper for that in that sense. In that sense, copper is a critical mineral because it is needed for power generation and for developing these kind of technologies in power generation. Critical minerals are also those that have a high risk of insufficiency or supply interruption. For instance, in the case of copper, what we want to see is that there is no related increase of prices. We can see at the bottom of the slide, we can see 
copper, lithium, nickel, man manganese, cobalt, graphite, chromium, molybdenum, zinc, rare earths, silicon, and others. All these are a set of critical minerals and they're essential for energy transition. But it's important not to run the risk of insufficiency or supply interruption. Given these characteristics, advanced economies or those economies that are consuming these minerals are carrying out big efforts. They're making big efforts to secure these elements. We have two examples here. We have the European Commission, which is the, the Critical Raw Materials Act that is trying to secure a, a secured and sustainable access to necessary raw materials. Something similar happens with the Mineral Security Partnership in the US. They are aiming at the same objective, trying to have a significant and stable provision of these elements. They also acknowledge that the production of these minerals in the economy has to be a process by which prosperity is generated. It should not be only an opportunity linked only to the mining sector. It should be an overall opportunity. That is to say that the power of these critical minerals should become an engine for the economies, and in particular for Latin American and the Caribbean economies. And therefore, we have the following conditions. Um, economies are demanding uh, big amounts of critical minerals. And given the elements that I exposed before, that I spoke about before, it is a big window of opportunity for Latin America and the Caribbean because they can produce high quality minerals, they can boost mining production, and at the same time, they can boost a sustainable mining that will result in economic development and industrialization of the region. And in order to leverage this opportunity, we would have to adopt a regional agenda. All this, as I said before, is a big opportunity, a tremendous opportunity for the region so that we can have a better production, in, uh, incorporating better technologies and processes. This is what we're proposing so that we can generate an alliance of mutual benefit for everyone. And we would also be able to collaborate with those uh, economies that are in high demand for these critical minerals. This would result in benefit for both regions. Latin America and the Caribbean, on the one hand, they have a big amount of, of these uh, critical minerals. And in order to be able to extract these minerals in a sustainable way, we would have to develop the economy around the mining sector. And then on the hand of advanced economies, they require these critical minerals with a sustainable and not unstable supply that would allow them to um, to develop economic development facing the 21st century, and that would allow them to have a reliable access to these critical minerals. Therefore, this would become an element of development and change. I just want to give you an example. Here we have the two sides of the coin. On the one hand, we have the potential supply. And on the other hand, we have some examples of how they're expecting to have an explosive growth of the demand for these products. For instance, we have uh, iron, we have oxide, zinc, nickel, graphite. We have all the examples here in the slide. In general, 
world reserves are over 20%. And in some cases like copper, it's around 70% and over 50% for lithium. So this results in an opportunity to be able to increase the, uh, the supply for these elements. In the case of cobalt and lithium, we are expecting an increase in the demand of around 40% for the year 2030. And this is only taking into consideration the demand for copper supply in order to have wind generators. We're hoping that the copper demand will increase in 4 million tons. That would be two Chile's productions or five Peru's productions increase. So therefore, this is a global effort. The same thing happens with other kinds of critical minerals like cobalt, rare earths, and they're expecting that it will increase 15 times only in the European Union. So that is an overview of the demand that could really boost the development of the production for these uh, critical minerals. Now, talking about the challenges faced by the region, we see that we also have an opportunity to incorporate know-how to the mining processes. And in doing this, we can also uh, generate some technological developments in the region. In the images that we can see here, we see how through scientific development, we can boost this. Sometimes, in the past the mining sector would be a little bit reluctant to taking this they were lacking they were lagging behind in the adoption of technologies but now they're catching up and we are seeing more growth in the mining sector that is quite higher than in the rest of the world or in the rest of the industries and there there's also a very significant event these patents and these developments come from the developed world, we can see an opportunity for potential alliances for knowledge providers and mineral providers to celebrate an alliance and guarantee a sustainable supply for these materials. We would also be able to have a, an inflow or a flow of knowledge as well as advanced technology exchange for that is going to be beneficial for many countries in the region. So the development would uh, consist of developing an agenda. This agenda would be able, allow us to make a journey from developing this uh, mining production areas in areas where there's a high um, mining potential and then being able to inject them with knowledge and technology that would allow mining economies to move from comparative advantages to competitive advantages. In Latin America and the Caribbean, we have this discussion, as well as in the world, as to where they are standing, whether they have comparative advantages or competitive advantages. We can see that there are different realities, but it is precisely that differences, those differences in realities that allow us to be able to um, work so that we can really um, boost those economies that have the potential for this technological development. And in other cases, we will have the opposite. I'll give you an example. In Colombia, they have a circular economy and they're an example for that. So we could leverage their knowledge on circular economy so that we can transfer that knowledge from Colombia and inform other economies and other countries in the region. And that could be linked to the development in more advanced economies. For instance, underground um, work. I'll give you an example. 
uh, in Costa Rica, the underground work as well as the protection of the ecology. That would allow us as well to identify specific niches. Therefore, we have to develop an integrated, a comprehensive agenda that would allow us to keep up the pace and we would also be able to develop a national and a regional cluster to develop those technologies that we need to industrialize the region and also to provide the critical minerals that are so much needed in the world. Part of this development is related to specific technologies that are of course typical of the 21st century. Here in this slide, we can be the development and sustainability. But for this, we need to have solutions that will cater for the mining supply chain. We would also have to work with a recycling and circular systems. Now we have some developments, for instance, the shared economy, we the shared hybrid infrastructure, then solutions based in nature. We would have some solutions, for instance, related to adaptation to climate change or the fight against climate change. We also have electromobility. Then we also have the development of circular economy, compensations for the carbon clubs, and then also working towards green and renewable energies. Therefore, we would have to develop this platform in order to develop technologies to be able to work in different niches in new economic development sectors, etc. The impact is huge. Here we can see some of the numbers. If we look at mining countries, we can see that the impact on production is very relevant. In Chile and Peru, we're talking about a 10%. But then if we add the supply chain to this, only optimizing the purchase processes, we can see that the volumes are extremely significant. And that is the result of local clusters that generates as well high quality employment. And we have to think that but for every position generated in the mining industry, we will also have three to four uh, um, employment that is related, positions that are related to the mining sector. So that will generate an opportunity for exporting these technologies. So also any development in green uh, uh, technology can also be exported to other countries and that generates another opportunity. So there's a big opportunity for synergies and collaborations that we will allow to have on the one hand, a better supply of critical minerals. And on the other hand, will allow us to bridge the gaps uh, to be able to have more advanced economies. I want to give you an example here, Peru. If Peru would be were able to deploy its full potential, this would be their growth rate. The blue line would be the speed at which the Peruvian economy would be developing. There would also be a convergence to what is considered a developed country, and that would be by around the year 2050. But if they included some uh, mining projects, that would be that would be achieved by the year 2040. And if they included more sophisticated developments, they would be able to achieve this by the year 2030 or in the 2030s uh, decade. Now, which are the key, the key elements? First of all, exploring the institutional capacities and skills needed to be able to do the, uh, the proper assessments. Second, attracting investment. 
this is crucial to be able to transform Latin America into the production of these critical minerals in a sustainable way. And then a third, we would have to consider which are the processes to provide legitimacy to all these social licensing and mining operations. This is what should be considered by the governments in the region. And here we talk about something more specific. We can see the scopes of action and also specific points where the mining actors can um, act. We would have to make additional efforts, not only for systemizing information, but also to um, categorize it so that we would have a right registry of critical minerals in the region. We would also have to identify which are the gaps that are in the way of our achieving this goal. We would also have to see what measures are, are need to be taking in terms of uh, environment protection, uh, employment development, etc. We would have to identify which are the gaps, which are the priority actions that need to be taken in order to develop um, the critical mineral sustainable development. We would also need to have a statistic system that will allow us to have a more informed decisions. We would also need this in order to be able to have a good source of information to make these decisions and to develop our sector. We would also need a follow-up system to be able to also identify which are the social environmental factors affecting the production and the mining operations. And we would also have to explore the um, legislation development opportunities that we have in the area. We would also have to identify which are the efforts that are possible in the different regions. And this would have to be reassessed and reviewed at every CAMA session that we have yearly. As a conclusion, this is a unique opportunity, but it is transitory. We are not the only region working on this. There are other regions working on the same thing. So we have to act fast. We have to have this sense of urgency. And we would also have to have this regional proposal. And we have a very big opportunity in Peru and other countries because they are already um, producing these minerals that are so needed for energy transition. And also we have so many natural resources to cater for this. So we just need to inject the necessary technology so that we can boost this production. This is my presentation so far. So now we will start with the panel and we're going to discuss the main elements of what I have just spoken. This way we will be able to discuss which elements should be present in this regional agenda. We have four representatives from four countries. They have four different views. We have representatives from the US, Brazil, Costa Rica, and the US, uh, sorry, Chile and the US. We would have Jose, sorry, um, Anna Spitzberg, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Department, the State Departments of the United States. She is representing the US. She also represents the National Agency of Renewable Energy. Annabelle, Annabelle and Anna, welcome. We also have Annabel Marine, who is from the Science, Technology and Innovation Department. She knows anything related to uh, these processes of industrializ industrialization and technification. She works with uh, different industries as the mining industry. And she can discuss how we can support the development of this industry. We also have Reynaldo Mancin, who is the director of international relations of, Brazil, of the IBRAM in Brazil. 
He has decades of experience in environmental projects, sustainable development, urban planning, biotechnology, mining, and including sustainable mining and innovative developments in different countries. We also have Jose Miguel Benavente, who has a wide experience in technological development in practically all the countries of the region. He has currently been working in the development of public policies to be able to explore the opportunities for sustainable mining related to mining development. Okay, so I have introduced our, our panelists. I want to start these discussions with a general question. For those of you who are in the audience, I just want to remind you that you can write down your questions in the Q&A button, and we will answer those questions at the end of the panel. The first one has to do with the benefits of a regional agenda. I want to ask the same question to all three of you. The effort of being able to generate critical minerals like nickel, rare earths, copper, etc. If this is big or re already at national level, contexts are develop uh, developing and political uh, predisposition is already there, which would be the benefits of a coordinated work within all the governments. Okay, let's start with you, Jose Miguel. Can you tell us which is your vision of which benefits would come from um, regional collaboration? Could you make a special emphasis on the benefits from the point of view of industrialization processes? So I will ask you please to speak for four minutes, tops, because we have to keep up with time. Thank you very much, Osvaldo. Can you all hear me? Hello, everyone. Hello to my colleague panelists, Annabelle, Anna, Reynaldo. I was a little bit late to the party, but I already saw your document. So I saw some of the um, points that you touched on. And I think it's important to consider some of the things that you mentioned before. When we think of the regional development, beyond the elements you, that you mentioned at individual level and environmental and social licensing, etc., I think we should also consider uh, things at the country level. Working jointly with the region, the, the countries in the region would be crucial. Because first, if we can see this in your presentation already. We would have to see which would be the public goods that would be beneficial for the whole region as a whole. For instance, information today it's really costly to develop the capacities for information in order to be able where we can have different productions, etc. So I think it would be very beneficial that we could generate these public assets that could be shared by all the countries so that we could consult them when needed. We can discuss this further after. The second aspect that I want to mention is learning. There are a different experiences in the different countries, and they have been important learnings in the copper industry. For instance, Chile has over 100 years of experience. Their experience started um, before the, the year 1978. But there are other countries like Argentina and Bolivia who are coming a little bit later to the party. And I think that the idea of having this collective learning is very positive because we can have lessons learned on the good things and the bad things. So from the point of view of what to do, having this collective learning would be extremely beneficial for the region. This would generate a space for exchanging experiences, for sharing knowledge. I guess that in your presentation, you went into details into this, but I didn't see it. Now, another aspect is something that is related more to the private sector, which is scale economy. 
in Chile in particular, we have been discussing this for, uh, extensively, is that we have to work towards the um, production chains, something that would generate local value that would allow us to share knowledge at a local level as well. But in many cases, scale for these developments does not coincide with the national development. So sometimes uh, the countries or the mining companies get involved in this sustainable development, but they need to divide the total cost into unit cost. And it's not so easily done. It's not so easily done in one single country. So having a more agglutinated region would allow that, that to happen. Scale economy would be a big opportunity in this sense. And the last element is um, scope economies. For instance, Chile does not have some of the minerals that were mentioned there, but some other countries do have it. But Chile does have the technology that it is that is needed to um, produce those other minerals that are present in other countries. So there could be a collaboration, there could be a joint action to be able to produce those minerals, and that will re result in the benefit at the global level. So basically, learning, scale economy, joint collaboration, these are key elements that will allow the region to develop further. So my four minutes are over. So thank you very much, Annabelle. Same question for you. Could you answer the same question focused on the social development and how a regional agenda could help? Four minutes, um, but please turn on your mic. No, we cannot hear you. I don't know if the other panelists can hear you. No, we cannot hear you. Uh huh. Are you using any microphone? Okay. I'm, I'm guessing she's telling us to move forward and then see how we can solve our problem. How can we overcome the technical problem? Now, the same question, which are the benefits of a regional agenda from the point of view of the industry? Good morning, Osvaldo and my pan fellow panelists. I'm going to be speaking Portuñol, which is a mix of Portuguese and Spanish. Apologies for that. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges. We have to take into consideration that the two accidents that we had here in Brazil were disastrous. The impact was felt not only here in Brazil, but around the world because the reputation of the mining sector now here is bad. It was never good, but now it's worse. So our social licensing has been even more, more complex right now. So every time there's an accident, there's reputational impact. So we have to always consider reputation. We have to see what, what we can do for the mining sectors. Here, uh, there are some not so safe situation in some tailing dams, etc. So we have to explore the technical aspect, the regu regulatory aspect as well. Now, talking specifically about Brazil, Brazil is a huge country. Its territory is enormous. However, we have a low geological knowledge. We consider that one in 100,000 um, square feet of our underground is really known. And we're saying that only 4% of our territory is actually known for its um, geological potential. So this is a critical point for us. We need to boost our geological knowledge. 
And we also have to consider a critical element either also. It is not easy to secure financing for um, mineral or mining projects. It has been so for many years. We have to, uh, to see how we can attract those who really know the risk of mining and know how to work with that. We need to secure that funding. And we also need to add value to the mining production. We, we are providing not only commodities, because providing only commodities is no longer, will no longer cut it. The society wants more. We have to add something. We have to add value to these commodities that we are providing. And particularly here in Brazil, when we're adding value, we have to pay more taxes. So one thing is exporting commodities only. Another thing is adding value to those commodities. So by doing that, even though it is sustainable, it is going to be less lucrative. It's going to be less profitable. Therefore, we have to consider Brazil, and not only Brazil, there are other uh, eight countries in the region that share the Amazonian forest. In the area, we have more and more mining that is deeper into the Amazonian forest. So there are many social challenges. Social licensing is very complicated. When we try to explore the Amazonian forest opportunities, and my four minutes are over. Thank you very much. So, Annabelle, can you now talk? Oh, my. We cannot hear you. My suggestion, log out and then log in again, and then uh, we can continue with um, our next speaker. Anna, it is your turn. Which are the benefits from your point of view and from the point of view of the U.S. in order to launch a regional agenda, including all Latin American and the Caribbean countries? Four minutes. Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't time myself. Uh, <laughs> try and answer that question well. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Go ahead. Fantastic. I, I really appreciate the question. It's a rich one um, because I think what we see today is a global agenda on critical minerals. My team, of course, focuses on the geopolitics of the energy transition. It's what led us to focus on supply chains, which led us to focus and have critical minerals top of the list. And if we step back for us, we do this so we can pursue U.S. commitments domestically and internationally on deploying clean technologies, uh, which you pointed out in your presentation. The same goals that many of our partners around the world have, which is good because we can pool resources to achieve our targets. And what that really means is working together to create resilience, to create transparency, to create sustainability in our supply chains. And so our lines of action tie to those goals. It's why in June, Under Secretary of State Jose Fernandez launched the Mineral Security Partnership, MSP. And that really aims to catalyze investment in strategic mining, processing, and recycling projects that adhere to the highest ESG standards. And I can't tell you how happy I am that when you talked about the MSP, you mentioned the goal of creating an engine of growth for communities. It's, it's something that's really core and important to the MSP. And I'm, I'm happy to see others reflecting that and feeling it, um, especially because we see that holding a lot of potential for helping Latin American countries to sustainably develop their critical mineral resources. Uh, because as this group knows, and as we saw in the earlier presentation, the region is rich in resources like nickel, cobalt, titanium, graphite, copper, rare earth elements, and of course, lithium, a resource of highest demand that's become famous, I feel like, over the past year, and one where Latin America really holds more than 60% of all identified resources around the world. So from a regional perspective, we very much want to work with Latin American countries on this initiative. And last month, we organized the first MSP ministerial, and it was on the margins of the UN General Assembly so that we could really hear from mineral-rich countries. And Secretary Blinken and Undersecretary Fernandez were joined by senior officials from Argentina and Brazil. And our team has been engaging others across the region throughout the launch of the MSP. 
Now, I want to back up and say also that in addition to catalyzing funding from a wide range of countries that are large investors and off takers who really committed to partner on investment, we understand how important it is to support countries on building the internal infrastructure to attract investors to high standard projects. I was watching the questions on the chat come through and questions such as how do you make certain environments more attractive? How can you put funding into risky um, regions or ones where there isn't regulatory transparency? And that is really why for a few years, our Energy Bureau of the State Department through our Energy Resource Governance Initiative has really supported countries on topics ranging from fiscal regimes to regulatory compliance, to market competitiveness, to mineral geology, to environmental regulation, because you don't run away from that. Those are things we all, in each of our markets, including the US, we need to strengthen. And that the work that we've done includes countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, such as Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama. We have an active bilateral working group with Brazil on these issues. And in our work, a key line of effort is really to add value to the, to the resource base, which I think listening to all the panelists is going to be a continuing theme and looking at the, the comments coming through. Um, so this is very key to us. And the other line of effort is advancing research and innovation in the sector from which all benefit. So I would say it's a global agenda with high potential in the region. And we have multiple lines of effort uh, that we think is really important to look, to look at collectively. Muchas gracias, Ana. Veamos a Anabel si ahora. Thank you very much, Ana. Anabel, can you hear us now? Can we hear you? Yes. Now, what I'll ask you to cover is two questions. The advantages of having a regional agenda, especially related to conflict areas, and also the immediate actions that can be taken. There are opportunities, of course, but we have to transform those opportunities and translate them into action. So what are the actions that could be taken? Okay, let's start with the first question. Thank you very much and apologies for the technical difficulties. Now, before going specifically into conflict, I wanted to add to what they said. I heard um, Jose Miguel's presentation better and then I got distracted. But I would add to what Jose Miguel said in relation to a regional advantage. We can also have a political economy beyond uh, fiscal or uh, general economy. We can see the possibility of the development of providers, etc. But that also depends on global conversations that we can have. So having a regional view would be better. That would allow us to secure cer certain activities and that would allow us to position ourselves as a region. And of course, each of the countries will benefit from a regional view, a regional approach. Now, regarding conflict, I'm going to try to be as specific as possible. The first advantage is related to the fact that conflict was local before. However, now it's going from local to national to global. So purely local approaches are not effective anymore because some conflicts are connected and related and having impacts not only at national level, but also at regional and global level. So the approaches should also be regional or global. Also, we need to take into consideration that conflict has been escalating, has been growing and becoming more and more visible. And this is so because we have a global context of a crisis in development models. In develop in Therefore, this is related to a strategic point of view. It cannot be regionalized or it cannot be localized anymore. It has to be a more all-encompassing uh, strategy. And that has to do with um, need. But we also have to see that the it, it is related to opportunity because we could seize the opportunity at a regional level. We could position the region in this need for uh, critical minerals. 
we should see how a pioneer a region based um, was able to boost other exports based on a agreement. I'm going to call this a pact or agreement because um, mineral tension cannot be tensions in the mineral sector cannot really be done away with, but we would have to still combat them. So we have to take this big challenge of conflict and use it as an opportunity to position the region so that we can have a just transition. And a just transition cannot happen if it's not properly negotiated, if it is not properly discussed. In the region, we could take this opportunity of um, a social um, environment that is more uh, positive for this development of critical minerals. And therefore, Latin America would be able to have a better position as a compact region. It would be able to position itself as a region that is selling minerals that are just, that are fair. And we would be able to use this word that is so much used worldwide sustainability, something that can be not so abstract and more tangible for people. Now, second question. I don't know if you want me to answer that second question now. No, let's continue with the panel. So now let's go to Rinaldo, talking about concrete actions, short-term actions and strategic actions focused on what you were mentioning, productive development, added value. I think mining could be a platform for that development, for electromobility development, circular economy development, but they could also be an adopter of technology. We wanted to um, be able to make mining a platform for this development so that we can develop the mining sector further. I see that there is a commitment, a will, and an agenda from Brazil so that these developments can happen locally in your country. And this, in the short term and in a strategic way, would be able to boost this development. I like an example that we have here a lot. It is very recent. We call it the mining hub. It is a hub for open innovation. There are no patents. Everyone works together towards finding a solution for the mining sector. We started three years ago after the accident that we had in our country, one of the two. And we said, OK, we have a challenge. For instance, circular economy. Therefore, we called a group of experts, small technology companies, and we asked them to search for solutions. Whatever solution they find, they share it with everyone. There are no patents. And this has been a success ever since three years. This is characterized by the private sector. It is sustained by them. And that attracts talent, technology talent, mining talent, development talent. And this effect can be multiplied by all the Latin American countries. Of course, we have to have our food on the door of academics as well because they are the ones who are producing for the future. They're producing knowledge for the future. And we also have to think that within the mining activity, what legacy we're leaving behind? What legacy are we leaving to the society after 40 years of operation? We also have to think what knowledge legacy we can leave behind. A legacy for people who can have new ways of facing the future. And in this sense, the contribution of mining is very interesting. This is the example I always cite in Brazil, because this is very good. We can see that the private sector is leading in this sense. Thank you very much. 
Let's see how we can transform that Brazilian mining hub into an America's mining hub. Now, Jose Miguel, focused on your experience, uh, for instance, green hydrogen, how do you see within the context of uh, um, industrialization, how mining could become a platform for this development for Latin America and the Caribbean, so that all the countries in the region can participate in green hydrogen. And of course, that's um, spreading through the rest of the region. And again, how that could be viewed from the context of a regional agenda. Well, you actually uh, depicted this before. We are developing um, green hydrogen development policy in Chile, not only because we think of this uh, from the energy points of view, but because we want to decarbonize the country. In order to do this, that we need green hydrogen. We also need to develop lum lumber as well. Now, within the particular context of green hydrogen, where mining is related, we think that we need three pillars for this development. One is the supply for this green hydrogen. Another one that is very important is local demand. We're working so that our traditional Chilean sectors can transform into this green energy. And of course, the mining sector is very important together with agri-industry and transportation. These are key sectors because we have copper and other metals that we're producing and they will help us to lower our footprint. We also have the water sector and diversification will be crucial. What we actually do is generating a clear relevant and strong demand to be able to develop a set of supply it could be local and also uh, regional or international so that we can develop green hydrogen in the mining industry and that of course generates these links that you were mentioning before now regarding what you were uh, saying before on the one hand we have the supply and the demand and any aspects related to human capital development, technological development, etc., because those are all relevant to this uh, broader development. Now, regarding the second question, depending um, this public policy that I would mention too in Chile, what is what we call innovative public purchasing? This is a concept that doesn't exist in our countries. One of the countries that has uh, developed this the most is Spain. Uh, the IDB is very much uh, involved in this. Public companies, uh, state-owned companies, not public, state-owned companies um, in Spain and also in Colombia and Mexico play a role in this innovative public uh, purchases. And this is a mechanism that encourages the local supply to develop further, to innovate further, to really cover for this um, or cater for this uh, demand. This would have a very important uh, impact. And there has been a very interesting agenda for researching in this uh, area. And then we have another example, which is the coordination, public-private coordination, state-private owned companies working together, working jointly, not only working uh, in, in, with the companies, but also working with the mine, Ministry of Mining, etc., so that we can coordinate the action with the public administration in our country. We have the opportunity to create this joint collaboration with the public and state-owned companies so that we can draw an agenda that is relevant to both of them, a joint agenda that would allow us to learn on how to develop not only the collaboration, but also the coordination, private-public collaboration. 
that would allow us to have uh, executive round tables. Peru is a good example. Argentina has done that as well. Chile is doing it at the moment. That would allow us to have some innovation where the private sector could bring um, bring to the discussion some um, challenges that they're facing or gaps that they're identifying and that could the, that could be approached in a joint collaboration and that would be an opportunity for learning thank you, thank you very much Anna, after listening to her say miguel and reinaldo the picture that i get is that mining for latin america and the caribbean equals the defense and industry of nasa right those be the hubs for innovation right Entonces, el, so vemos that would que be no es necesidad de mayor conocimiento, de mayor innovación, the, the podrían ser in, in incubadas en, en la minería, porque la so minería tiene una plataforma para el hidrógeno, genera una plataforma para la electromovilidad, genera una plataforma para la solución de la naturaleza, y operaría um, efectivamente como nuestra NASA, como nuestra, based nuestro solutions, sector etc. de defensa. ¿Cómo Again, that would be comparable esta, to your defense uh, sector in your country. So, how do you see this, this vision of seeing mining as a hub for innovation, something that will allow us to develop, but also to develop innovation and technology? From the U.S. point of view, do you see any efforts or any programs, any concrete examples that you could give us from the U.S. that we could use as a, an example to follow? or? to draw ideas from? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start off by saying the amount of research occurring in this space is, is truly incredible. So in the US, it is happening across our national laboratories, uh, companies, universities, some agencies, including on the defense side, are very involved in the innovation component of this. And of course, as everyone said, one of the best things we can do is share best practices and then provide technical support to foster that innovation in the mining sector. So we create those attractive markets. Um, I mentioned the Energy Resource Governance Initiative, ERGI, before, and I'll use it as an example again. So over the, the last few years, ERGI has provided over $25 million of technical support to more than 15 countries around the world. And I mentioned some of the commercial, regulatory, technical issues, but there's a component that's very much focused on sharing industry and expert practices and really looking at what are the new what are the new things that are coming out that we can bring uh, to our partners and allies? So for example, we have an Ergi Academy. The Academy brings government officials from partner countries to Reno, Nevada to learn about world-class practices. So it allows us to immerse foreign governments in the US mining sector, learn, as Jose Miguel said, the good and the bad, and help create connections to, to US academia and private sector counterparts and do all this uh, while, while building governance capacity to, to facilitate more development. Um, the Academy just started hosting delegations and this past uh, summer, we were happy to welcome Colombia and Argentina. Um, and since I mentioned Argentina, I'll note that we, we partner with Argentina's Secretariat of Mining on Sustainable Brine Lithium Development, uh, which brings together federal and provincial governments in Argentina to harmonize sector management and attract outside investment. And so much of that has to pull from innovation. Um, in fact, members of my team are in Argentina today working with the federal and provincial governments on these issues. Um, and I also want to note that domestically, we're investing in a significant amount of R&D. I don't think it's a secret. I think folks have seen our bipartisan infrastructure bill. They've yeah. seen the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it includes, ish, it includes um, research components such as recycling, automating removal of rare earth magnets, uh, supporting demonstration projects to reclaim, remediate, restore abandoned mine wastes. Uh, much of it is really looking at extracting and producing high purity minerals while having less environmental impact and lowering the cost, right? That's, that's what we really want to be doing. And for us, we know the benefit of that development is global. Everything we do on the research side, the idea is push commerciality so that it goes to the rest of the world. Same thing on hydrogen. We're talking about green hydrogen. The lessons, I think, from the U.S. is uh, can be gained from some of the things our Department of Energy is doing and the hubs that they're setting up. So the hydrogen hub is very much focused on the goal of a dollar per kilo per kilogram of hydrogen, green hydrogen within a decade. And they, they're trying to stick to this goal. I was at Department of Energy years back when we set goals uh, for solar and we blew those goals out of the water three years earlier. So I actually am confident when we get, when we really put our resources together, we set targets, we can accomplish that. And that benefit rolls right over. So we're, we're trying to tackle this in a number of ways. Okay, thank you. 
Una, una pregunta adicional antes de pasar las preguntas de just a, la an additional question Por before favor, we go into the minutos, audience ¿eh? questions and I just ask you Anabel all to take two minutes on temas de gobernanza y continuidad I want to start with you, Annabelle. It has to do with governance and continuity. We know that in the region, it is challenging to provide continuity to the efforts. It is challenging to, therefore, achieve maturity. And the experience in general hasn't been a happy experience so far. So, Annabelle, which elements do you think would allow us to have uh, a governance approach at a regional level so that we could really secure social support, legitimacy, and continuity? Continue to throughout a, different administrations. Okay, I'm just going to say something about the very specific about concrete actions, something that I can say about context we are saying, and I think Rinaldo said it very clearly, that there is a lot of conflict in the region, in the sector. Conflict in Latin America has been studied from the point of view of the um, claims file. We don't have good evidence if we want to approach this to promote changes. If we want to understand what are the conflicts, what kind of aspects are being disputed, what kind of strategies are being used, what, are, what strategies could be used. So we are not generating evidence systematically. We saw in Chile, for instance, for the first time, what is the conflict? I can tell you that 80% of mining investments in Chile, which is one of the most developed mining industries in the region, we see that um, there are certain types of conflicts, and we need to be able to analyze those if we really want to develop this sector further. And if we want to approach we need to understand this phenomenon better. Having done this analysis in Chile has been very positive. It has been very fruitful. And we would have to do the same in the other countries in the region. Because that would allow us to um, make informed decisions as to which approaches we need to follow. There are some countries that are really approaching the problems, but that is not known. So there is no enough evidence. We have been approaching this from the point of view of transformations, but we have not been able to provide evidence as to the approaches. We're always talking about social licensing, and I want to say that uh, this term has been not so widely accepted, and it has been a little bit degraded in the region. Because it seems that we're trying to sell an already set project to society that is demanding something else. They're demanding change. They're demanding that real challenges are being approached. Reynaldo was mentioning those big accidents that were real, untouchable. They happen. And we need to provide, to generate evidence that will allow us to negotiate with society and show them how we can approach this with actual change. Just one minute. So we also need to understand uh, much better what kind of approaches we need to follow in order to work with the social society, civil society and with the uh, society in general. We're talking about a sector that has a high level of conflict, but that conflict could be used as an opportunity to develop further. I, I also want to mention something that is related to this as well. We're not, uh, at a point where conflict and the political economy is um, deeper. You know, we are in the context of a crisis because um, the conflict is actually the symptom of the crisis that we have at the political level. Uh, the reality that I would see five, six years ago is not the same that, that the one that we see now. We have to be able to approach this from the point of view of processes so that this is truly sustainable. We have to think of negotiation legitimacy. 
we have to start using different words in order to be able to build this agenda. We have to add to the private and public joint action, the social civil society as well. We have to promote changes, technological changes, um, approach changes that will really um, Gracias, Ana. try to Reinaldo, work with this conflict that is happening. ¿Qué, qué Reinaldo, para darle what would you add? What elements do we need to provide continuity to this regional agenda and to add traction, of course? I think the word here is transparency. Transparency in everything. We had many problems here because there was a lack of transparency. So generating new ways of having more transparent conversations, being able to manage expectations as well, is very important. Here, there's a movement from the mining sector, which is the joint financing. We know that we do have this uh, tax crisis. There are budget limits as well. There's money limits to finance this uh, from the uh, public agencies. But there is a will from the private sector to integrate. And we see how mining agencies collaborate to improve their technological uh, capabilities. They're getting um, support from the private sector. The same thing happens with the geological service. El modelo público ha encontrado limites, ¿no? Entonces hay del lado de Because cada, uh, idea when de you had approaches eh, that were only public based, sociales, ¿no? hay, hay um, they had their limits. So now we have to find the collaboration with the private sector in order to be able to develop them further. De hay que crear so we do de need diálogo. financing. Entonces, Therefore, we need to create the space for that financing to happen. So the idea of having dialogues, dialogues with people, with the private sector. So again, we go back to the first um, point I made, reputation. We have a bad reputation. We have had some negative views. We are viewed negatively, and we have to change that in the short term. We have to work towards a Gracias. common transparency. José Miguel, that is the way to go. Eh, eh, Thank you very much. And Jose Miguel, I want to also include a question from the chat here. This, uh, uh, this idea of governance eh, systems so that we can approach continuity. And this is related to also to the capacity of generating the processes so that investment projects can really be reviewed properly so that the good ones really make it to the financing part. We also have to enhance public capability. Even when we do have support from the private sector, which is significant, sometimes we don't have the, um, the resources needed, and sometimes even though we do have the will, sometimes we don't have the resources to do it, and that is um, making it uh, slowing down this process. In the chat, there are many comments and questions regarding this precisely. So how do you see this? How do you think we can face this challenge so that we can really discard those bad projects and focus on the good ones with good potentials. And how would be, we be able to approach that big gap <laughs> and bien amplio, boost pero así, abilities tres, and tres elementos que capacities? Con respecto al, al, well, that's a, a quite a broad mencioned. question, but I think there are three um, main primero, el, entender ese, ese conjunto de First of all, we have to understand that set of abilities. We have to understand that the government needs to no have, need, que needs que tiene to be equipped with this set of abilities. They need to have the technical ability to be able to review the projects and follow all the legislation. And then also, I'm going off on what Rinaldo and Alain said. 
A veces hay faltas de capacidad de estructura problemas para que a través de compras públicas, como la que yo mencionaba, pueda haber una solución provista por privada por el mundo científico, por that, empresas instance, públicas, en public fin, purchasing, pero eso really provide que los ministerios sectoriales vinculados con el sector minero en particular tengan esas capacidades in-house. Y tercer elemento que es importante en capacidades es justamente cuando los temas que hablaba Anabel y Rinaldo We have to think of what Annabelle and Rinaldo were mentioning. Conflict. The state needs to be able to understand the elements that are related to the project that are not only related to technology and finances. These are things that are related to, for instance, how we really can link to the organized society, how we can approach the community. This is more developed in Brazil and Argentina, but there are other countries that do not have that as much developed. So we do need a capacity for action of the public sector in the mining. And because what happens is that sometimes they mix everything and they don't see the differences Because um, there are different problems that have to do with the different uh, syncrasies, conflicts, etc. But that is not seen individually. To give you an example, Chile is pushing an agenda that is trying to define their decisions and their orientations. But for that, we need the state to have local capacities, not only technological capacities, financial capacities and other kinds of capacities que son necesarias cover all these para other llevar aspects, un acuerdo y un proceso relativamente eficiente, logrando de alguna manera esta, process, esta, esta, esta capacidad en estos tres uh, niveles y estos tres ámbitos. Projects. Y creo que en so Latinoamérica en general, three levels, con algunas excepciones, está un poco el déficit en eso. Mm -hmm. So, Muchas gracias, José Miguel. I think that Latin America And, is a little bit lacking in this sense. Eh, siguiendo And, con los temas de gobernanza y now, eh, con with la regional, And with the regional, en los últimos the, años ha aparecido con mucha fuerza los estándares ESG, in the tanto last, de, desde el punto de vista years, de acceso a capital como de acceso a mercado. ASG Pero junto con el, el surgimiento de estos so estándares también hay una cierta proliferación de muchos más. Hay cientos de organizaciones que están haciendo estándares ESG, ASG, Of organizations that are producing no these buenas, standards. Some are eh, good, some are not so good. And that runs the risk of that, that certification is losing validity. That this is not so prestigious anymore. Desde so, el punto de vista eh, de una agenda regional, ¿tú ves que hay algún rol para poder agenda? darle una mayor racionalidad a un sistema de estándares que sean integrados, que haya pocos eh, eh, marcos para poder evaluar los estándares so que efectivamente really transformen un sello ASG en un valor, no solamente so en un have a value. These certifications ¿Cómo lo ves tú como parte de una, de una, de una agenda eh, regional? Yeah, that's a it's a good question. Um, I think it will take time, and the fact that there's so much more attention, <laughs> nobody wants to hear this, but the answer to almost most things in mining is it will take some time. Um, and there is a lot of attention, and we do have to recognize there's more attention in this space than, than ever before. I can't overstate the importance of ESG standards to our critical mineral efforts. We're constantly talking about the need to provide a net positive to communities, to the environment, to creating a race to the top. Um, and what that means is creating a signal with our supply and our offtake agreements and our public investments that high standards are worth the added cost and that we will pay. Um, and so of course, the next question is, what is that? What are the standards? So right now we're working together in terms of the Mineral Security Partnership, we're working together with Canada and other partners to develop a rigorous ESG due diligence, due diligence and assessment framework for the Mineral Security Partnership. It's not about um, bringing something in, but it's knowing that when the mineral security partners agree to invest in something, they're striving for best in class. And there's a way to look and say, uh, we've, we've reviewed everything that's out there. So, and as you noted, there are many frameworks and standards already in existence. We have the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. The, in mineral specific, we have independently reviewed sustainability standards Um, such as those maintained by IRMA, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, 
uh, TSM towards sustainable mining initiative. My head is an acronym uh, <laughs> bubble these days, uh, but I but it, which shows there are many, and and we're really trying to draw upon these and other standards to develop the ESG framework and the risk mitigation strategy. So take what's out there, take all the knowledge that's out there for the strategies that at least the MSP partnership will do. Um, I also want to stress that in addition to what is happening under the MSP, there's a stronger focus than I've ever seen before across the US government to develop strong, credible standards for extraction and processing of critical minerals. It was uh, a priority for President Biden from day one. It was laid out in executive order in America's supply chains. And all of our government agencies are working together to engage tribal nations and other key stakeholders to really create those standards. And again, all of it is learned. It's, it's, it's taking what we're seeing out there. And unfortunately, when you have an environment of lots of standards, the best thing you can do is really look at what, what makes sense and what doesn't and what is being um, utilized by different industry members and how. Uh, now, of course, there are challenges that come with having this many and companies are gonna find it difficult to invest in a single standard. These are rigorous, they're database, they require companies to manage and measure information that they might not collect otherwise, which of course means there's a disadvantage to smaller and newer companies um, that want to demonstrate that they're willing to meet the standards, uh, but these all take financial resources and people and time. Uh, but it will over time become easier, especially if it becomes the norm. So I think we're getting to a place where everyone is circling around creating a norm and creating and looking at standards and knowing which are the ones that are valued the most. Um, and there are success stories, which I, I see in the region. If we look at SQM in Chile, which joined IRMA uh, and began an independent audit this year against one of the most comprehensive and rigorous sets of mining standards, it's it sent a signal that it took standards that were very well regarded, and it was sending the signal that community engagement and health and safety are a priority. Uh, and by embracing that, I think, as long as companies are, are looking at it and really putting resources into it, they're going to be valued. And if we do it across the value chain, I think the Americas region can lead in, in the future of what we call responsible mining and we'll navigate this space. Muchas gracias. Y estamos entrando a las preguntas de, del chat, así que voy a elegir okay, una so now let's go into the chat part. So I'm going to take one no, no for each of you. And I apologize to all of those who are not going to see their questions eh, answered, Miguel, but we don't have much time. Eh, aparece como una inquietud el tema de so cómo poder, eh, there's that concern here eh, as to how la to de valor, eh, a la industria, a la industria minera. Capture the value esta, esta, in the mining industry. Que, por un lado, hay un mayor and we have this interpretation that, on the one hand, we have more processing, de, de el valor, por ejemplo, and that is the way for capturing cobre, uh, value, por ejemplo, for, for instance, in copper processing, en, en or de, de, de in the particip participation el, el, in the development of lithium batteries. De valor But then, on the other hand, we have the ways of capturing value through this lateral linking. This is a little bit less present in the public debate, but it's important. So I'd like to leverage your experience in this sense so that you can talk about these two options for capturing value and how we can capture value by structuring service chains, technology chains, supply chains, so that we can really generate um, Sí, value not only the air, but also el, downstream. Eh, bueno, tú lo conoces de cerca, Osvaldo, I think this is important, no sé and Osvaldo, you know this very well. Abajo abajo the development en, upstream en and downstream. Eh, por, por todo this lo que has had different experiences en el fondo due to what we all know, and in some cases Australia this was achieved in countries as Australia. I think Australia is the best example of this, como en tu misma presentación um, providing de services, hacerlo, exports, primero porque lo hicieron and having the possibility to do it. it. The first advantage they had is because they did it early. Part of the development, development of the strategy in those countries was that they incorporated these sectors, this view, early on. 
que el Estado estuvo presente para empujar esta agenda a través de distintos mecanismos de subsidios y apoyos, ¿no es cierto? Agenda, que una mirada quizás de eficiencia estática era quizás no una buena respuesta, pero una mirada de eficiencia dinámica les terminó dando la razón para estos países en particular de esa realidad de esos procesos. Yo creo que hoy ya se ha visto otra ventana que tú bien mencionabas, que el caso chileno no estamos ilustrando con el caso de hidrógeno verde, en el fondo que tiene que ver más bien con estos efectos más laterales, más que más dentro de la misma cadena. Nosotros pensamos, por ejemplo, de que el sector minero como un gran demandante de tecnología, de soluciones para reconversión en temas de energía verde, eso genera un encadenamiento potencial, ¿no es cierto?, de proveedores que puedan atender esa demanda que surge del sector minero, pero que son basadas, ¿no es cierto?, en energía. Eh, Based on en particular, energy, nosotros como Corfo estamos buscando los, la, las formas Here explícitas Corfo, para poder dar esos empujoncitos a aquellas empresas de alguna manera que tienen eh, eh, obviamente las capacidades para poder companies hacerlo. Diría, right pero bueno, pero si ese, el hidrógeno, por ejemplo, es una tecnología que tiene más de 50 años, ¿no sería más, es, más eficiente traer a proveedores internacionales de Europa existence. continental so a Chile say, para que el hidrógeno de la industria minera de la transformación? Es cierto. Y hay una mirada de eficiencia estática. Pero hoy día se ha abierto otra Pero ventana again, muy interesante, que es la siguiente. Eh, uno perfectamente podría apoyar a los países locales a hacer mecanismos de transferencia Because we could de esa very tecnología de estos proveedores internacionales a proveedores locales. Y uno diría, bueno, ¿cuál es el incentivo? Bueno, el incentivo son los bonos de carbono. O sea que de alguna manera uno compensa este so proceso con eh, la venta de bonos de carbono que la industria minera u otra que hacen la transformación. Pueden ser potenciales. Y hoy día, cuando uno mira un poco y conversa like con los países europeos, well. particularmente, ellos están más interesados Now, no en el desarrollo de sus side, empresas de proveedores para que se expandan en el territorio, incluido Latinoamérica, sino están mucho más interesados en recibir su cuota de carbono, porque están con mucho más acá, más acá, con más reacciones. Y por lo tanto, ahí se genera un espacio virtuoso en el cual, por una parte, uno puede transferir ese conocimiento a proveedores locales, materiales, ¿no es cierto?, asociados a la industria energética, para apoyar la transformación so we could help this um, energy, energy eh, industry so that we can support no esa reducción the production en of these production credit, no uh, carbon credits that could be sold to consumers no sé si in other no countries. Chilena, por de, this de carbono, would be good not only for Chile because we would be reducing carbon emissions but also we could uh, contribute to Europe for them to be able to buy carbon credits. Asociado, ¿no es cierto?, so a esta demanda enorme que está surgiendo en el sector como la minería y la transformación energética y cómo crear proveedores, ¿no es cierto?, que apoyen esa transformación. Anabel, en un minuto, Annabelle, ¿qué prácticas de colaboración propones para tener una agenda What integral en el regional? ¿Qué prácticas propones para que podamos tener una agenda regional agenda? No sé si entiendo la pregunta. I don't really know if I understand el, your question. ¿Qué prácticas de colaboración en nuestros países? Sí. ¿Colaboración en nuestros países? Eh, bueno, yo eh, creo okay. que en este tema quizás a diferencia de nosotros estamos mucho más regards, eh, like others, distantes de tener un entendimiento de cómo enfocarlo. Creo que nos tenemos que estar mucho más tecnológicos en este tema en la agenda de 15 años. De hecho, we should have had this agenda 15 years ago. We had this, sorry, the agenda 15 years ago. And we have learned quite a bit. We have been working with countries uh, like Australia, who have been working on this early on, and we could uh, leverage their lessons learned. We could learn from them. And we are a lot behind with the social, licensing, social uh, relation. De pérdida de, 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 de modelo, si ustedes quieren el desarrollo de crecimiento, que le da mucha más, si ustedes quieren el valor de estos conflictos, le ponen otra, uh, otra dimensión. Es un fenómeno nuevo. Es un fenómeno nuevo. Es un fenómeno nuevo. Es un fenómeno nuevo. Es la conflictividad se inserta en este nuevo fenómeno. Y vemos que la conflictividad es un primer paso que tenemos que hacer. Y el fenómeno de la conflictividad de esta región responde a cómo abordar. Así que lo primero que tenemos que hacer es entender qué caminos hay y para poder abordar la conflictividad y qué mecanismos podemos usar para abordar esto. Yo puse el ejemplo de Chile. Es algo diferente de lo que estamos haciendo porque no hay realmente un 
Es un fenómeno que realmente abordarlo desde sistemas más deliberativos. La transparencia, mencionó, pero no es suficiente si no se le agrega una acción de cambio. Approaches, but those are not enough if we don't add, you, add other approaches as well Muchas to gracias. be able to En la tarde se van a reunir los, los ministros Thank you para very much. poder discutir eh, In the afternoon, los elementos de una eventual agenda nacional. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué acciones? Voy a continuar the, con las uh, la, eh, preguntas de, de, de la audiencia, pero so les anticipo que les voy a pedir a cada uno de ustedes audience, que den un mensaje a los ministros respecto a qué es lo que hay que hacer si usted fue tuviera los zapatos de cada uno de estos ministros para tener una agenda regional que sea una agenda que efectivamente movilice recursos, genere tracción, que crea to mobilize resources, generate traction, attract investment, and really develop the region so that it can actually leverage all the opportunities. Okay. There's a question for Many Anne. organizations that oppose the mining industry are financed by U.S. organizations. How can they prevent that resources can be, can resources from being used from for, for this type of activity? Yeah, so I, I, if I understand the question correctly, I think there's a, a significant amount of stakeholders when it comes to yeah. mining. And we've had many nonprofit and environmental groups out there, and they've impacted projects in the US and they've impacted projects abroad. And they, at the end of the day, they are important stakeholders. So regardless of where these projects are, we need to create an environment, and we've spoken before, of transparency and of industry getting to a place where they're, it's clear they're building growth and they're helping the communities and that this is a part of our future. Uh, and I do think right now, all, a lot of governments are reviewing their mining regulations. I know in the US we are to make sure that it, it creates that environment for all. Yo creo que, que también es una pregunta para ti, Ana. Del, I think this is de, also a question for you, Ana. El financiamiento del, del activismo Financing eh, no necesariamente es algo activism negativo. Activismo no es necesariamente negativo. El, el prevenir ese financiamiento probablemente no es la, la, la respuesta. Financing, que tener, si, not the right answer, se, but se actually, recoge el, el, we should el, el conflicto. That. Eh, porque las demandas muchas veces son legítimas para Sometimes poder efectivamente the, the incorporarlas en el diseño tanto político como conflict. el diseño but de, then de we could use this to design Entonces, a more sustainable mining so it's the same question that I asked eh, Anne how can we channel these organizations that are being financed and that are related to the conflicts in the mining sector so that they can actually be drivers of change and drive us to change for good. Yes, this is mainly what I've been trying to say. The importance of understanding better first and understanding this phenomenon better and also starting to have a vision that is not related to suppressing the conflict, rather working with the conflict so that we can drive change. Los fenómenos por los cuales hay conflictos son, actually, reales, son verdaderos. No the phenomena that create tienen que ver parte de una real. legislación. Sometimes they have to do with an old legislation that is being revised and revisited. This is not going to change overnight. The fact that mining uses a lot of water generates conflict in Chile. The fact that it uses cyanide generates conflict in Argentina. Because there's a very bad history of the use of cyanide and pesticides in Argentina. So we have to see how we can work with that and leverage what the civil society has today, which is not the same as what they had 100 years ago. They are demanding change. And they're demanding change from the point of view of practices and technology, but they are also demanding change on participation. The fact that mining is a collective project has also to do with the fact that people feel part of it. These are territorial phenomena. This phenomena has its history, its resources, its culture, its reality. 
so we need to work together with the citizens and we have to change that and i think we know only a little bit of how to approach this we would have to work more on this terminology that it has to do with social licensing which as a matter of fact the community is kind of rejecting social licensing as a term so we have to work on those terms we have to work towards that towards that instead of suppressing it we have to work with it so that we can change the phenomenon and conflict can actually be used to drive change and with what we've been doing we have identified concrete situations where the social uh, civil society uh, can collaborate not from the sectional point of view but from the point of view of change and technology change and I think that's what we should be aiming at today, trying to identify, understand, and see how we can use conflict for the good. Rinaldo, una pregunta Rinaldo, muy difícil. Rinaldo no, a no very difficult question. I wouldn't want to be asked this question. You were talking about the tailings and the problems that you had in Brazil. Pero también sabemos que hay otros pasivos ambientales. But we know that y there también are sabemos others, que no sabemos um, exactamente cuál es la profundidad de esos pasivos ambientales. La contabilidad de los pasivos that. ambientales en el mundo And no se accountability of, um, Ay, no. Sorry, not accountability. Eh, the number en algún momento vamos a ver que hacer esa contabilidad va a saber efectivamente cuántos son los ambientales. Y en cada una de las cuencas, en cada uno de los valles, en cada uno de los territorios van a aparecer déficits que hay que eh, resarcir, pagos que hay que hacerle de vuelta a la naturaleza para recuperar, recuperar el capital natural para volver a tener un mundo eh, sostenible y equilibrado. Eh, and at Cuando some point, we will have to do it. Information, so se when va that information is going to start, por, por, eh, eh, of course, we are going to have uh, certain aspects related to it. So how the mining industry has the uh, change factor to have those balances and the transition in order to be able to compensate or recover that uh, natural minera. capital no está, no está redactada exactamente así la pregunta, pero well, the question es, es algo de, de mi opinión, tanto como dices tú, para, para ponerte en problemas. ¿eh? Hay dos caminos, por amor o por, por la adorno. <laughs> There are eh, two que ways. Lo que tuvimos acá fue por la adorno. The right way uh, and de, by force. The one we did was uh, indemnizaciones por el accidente. By force. Esta es una forma de hacer. Pero, Osvaldo, yo, yo, this yo is a way of doing it, but Osvaldo, we have tried here, we have tried to get this sector to embrace other agendas, not obvious agendas. For instance, bioeconomy, we don't have a direct relationship with bioeconomy, except for the preservation of big areas. Hace la preservación de áreas muy because we do have to Entonces, preserve eh, areas and that becomes interesting so we need to change Annabelle. the perception eh, of society si as Annabel said todos los días lo mismo, ¿no? vamos a trabajar, it's always vamos the a same thing we're going Entonces, to work on this we're going to do this we're going eh, to do that en, en como but we have like an um, an inception process in phase one, which is pushing this agenda of added value. What is that agenda? Water. Water is a very interesting agenda. And there's um, a lot of room for opportunity. Uh, yeah, a lot of opportunity for developing um, knowledge. So what I want to say is that next year we have uh, an event, we're going to be promoting this event for all the countries in the Amazon basin. basin. We are going to be discussing how mining can support bioeconomy so that we can leave a very good legacy behind. This is a way to respond to this question, to answer the question. We have to think outside the box. We have to find other ways to contribute. Puede ser un camino muy interesante. Para nosotros, and sometimes doing what is not obvious can be a very interesting path. Para trabajar. Gracias. 
And uh, we would find many opportunities to work. Now, thank you very much. And I ask you, Rinaldo, as well, to close a little bit with your recommendations and your messages for the meeting of ministers that is going to happen this afternoon. Well, in Brazil, we have a big capacity for agribusiness. We're well known for our capacities. We have a very diversified economy, but it is possible to double up. I think that the main message that we have to convey is that we can change. We can leave positive legacies. No hay renovación de recursos. Industry, pero, the, the mira, mining is a non-renewable industry, but we have to see what we could do. And let's remember, 100 years ago, as Switzerland was one of the, or the eh, most uh, important, no most, most significant country in terms of mining, and today they have no more resources. But Entonces, we could leverage their technology and we can uh, translate the, uh, mining into knowledge. We would be able to develop local communities through a non-renewable uh, industry, leaving a legacy behind, a legacy of knowledge Muchas and gracias, development. Rinaldo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ana. Rinaldo. Ana, what would be your message? What would be your recommendation for the ministers? I think it's the, it's really important to provide that consistent, unified demand signal to the market. They need to commit to ESG criteria from the government side because off-takers have made commitments to their shareholders. That's got to flow through. And they have to communicate that, men, that message, demonstrate targeted steps, and show they're really paying attention to the full value chain and creating strategic partnerships and helping industries create strategic partnerships. Uh, and one step that can be taken is really looking at regional capacity for refining and processing because that we talk about value, but value can come from co-locating midstream development and refining and processing, attract investment, add value segments like EV manufacturing over time. Um, and that will also create then a sustained demand signal for the mineral extraction in the country. The hard thing, and it's important for every country to balance, and we also have to balance it, everyone does, is creating the growth inside the country and leveraging the region to be competitive with the rest of the world. And that is tricky and it is really, and some of it comes down to policies. We've seen policy changes in Brazil this year uh, with the relaxation of rules on lithium exports. It's really important to look at that strategically and remember uh, we can do some things alone, but not everything. Muchas gracias. Jose Miguel. Thank you very much, ¿Qué, Jose qué Miguel. Would you like to add anything? Mira, el, que, que sobre los que I'd planteaba. like to reiterate on the manera, points that I was uh, mentioning before. I understand uh, that the aspecto, Minister of Ministry who is attending this session, some Pero lessons that they could take home, some takeaways, is that we have to have a more collective team. We have to be able to work in an aggregated way and in Primero, de nuevo, insistir esta idea de los bienes públicos, First insistir en la idea de que, por ejemplo, de cómo generamos información assets. que en el fondo sea útil para todos y generado por todos. Creo que eso es tremendamente importante. Day, we'll Entre ellos, por ejemplo, temas que tienen que ver everyone. incluso con temas eh, regulatorios, son clave, ¿no es cierto?, y ya, ya mencionado. Lo segundo, creo que justamente esta instancia con la que estamos Now, ahora es los temas de aprendizaje. Generar espacios comunes en el fondo para aprender de todos de todos con respecto a las experiencias de algunos y de otros, ¿no es cierto? En distintos sectores, other, de distintos de distintos productos, ¿no es cierto? Y creo que eso creo que es muy importante eh, una instancia is, uh, en el fondo más colaborativa, más, más agrupada. Lo tercero, entender que también cuando para, para los países nuestros, salvo con excepciones eh, como la, la de Brasil I u otros, en general son, son like países relativamente Brazil pequeños. Others, por lo tanto, si bien la escala productiva fue Pueden ser como um, viables financieramente y económicamente en el contexto de países de forma individual, 
Hay cosas que en el fondo tenemos que mirar de una forma colectiva However, cuando queremos desarrollar, por ejemplo, entrenamiento, generación de valor, ¿no es cierto? Como decía Ana, u otro, que de alguna manera necesitamos escala mínima que está más allá del tamaño que nuestros propios We países tienen. Y para eso necesitamos procesos de coordinación y ver que sean juegos de suma positiva so para todos los que juegan. ¿no? Y particularmente to todo lo que tiene que ver con economías this. de escala economía de ámbito. En ámbito incluyo también esta que estábamos conversando, uh, ¿no ¿cierto? De la, eh, economy, eh, transversales. Yo creo que, uh, laterales, yo creo que hay, uh, hay, uh, varias, uh, hay varios elementos que en el fondo el actuar colectivamente puede ser tremendamente importante, más allá de las cosas que cada uno se puede llevar a sus propios países y puede implementar a nivel individual, como la actuar relativamente Brazil. colectivo creo que puede ser But tener expresiones, ¿no es cierto?, eh, no solamente eh, en los temas eh, productivos que recién mencionaba, sino también, por ejemplo, en, lo, en los temas que ha levantado Anabel, en los temas que ha levantado Rinaldo, que tienen que ver también con los aprendizajes eh, de, de, y las tensiones que hoy día Latinoamérica está viviendo, ¿no es cierto?, y que el sector minero no está exento y no va a estar exento en el futuro, y creo que puede ser muy importante eh, eh, trabajar en forma colaborativa. Muchas gracias, Anabel. So we have to approach them. Anabel. Uh tu mensaje final y las recomendaciones words, para que your final words se incorporen and en la agenda regional. Ok, bueno, o sea, fundamentalmente, volviendo well, mainly, mismo, o sea, I go back to the 15 same años decíamos que, que teníamos que empezar a pensar en los recursos naturales como generadores de conocimiento y tecnología, novedoso, se adoptó el eh, bastante then, más de la información, estamos teniendo otra nueva generación de tecnología que teníamos hace 7 años. Yo hoy insistiría sobre este tema de hacer lo mismo, pero ahora con la confianza. Tenemos que tomarla mucho más seriamente. We have to take conflict more seriously. Today, the technological and productive policy needs to take into consideration the civil society. They cannot be isolated from this. They are not isolated from them. They are actually part of the very same phenomenon. And we need to think of ways for transforming conflict into change. This idea uh, that Rinaldo uh, mentioned of transforming um, mining into knowledge, but also transforming it into inclusive change, social change, and also developing this um, regional brand as a fair mining. We have to develop uh, more standards, more regulations, and that, I, I, don't think, sorry, I don't think that the answer is by generating more standards and more regulations. Regulations, because at the end of the day, it's going to be very crowded. And sometimes they are um, very local objectives. So we would have to have a more regional view. So thank you very much to all four of you. Más y mejor um, minería, usual, efectivamente, significa poder transformar ese rico capital geológico que tiene la región uh, en capital social, en, en capital tecnológico, en capital, en conocimiento, en capital uh, natural también. ¿no? Y el desarrollo eh, que muchas veces históricamente se había visto como una suerte de trade-off, hoy día lo estamos viendo como una, sort of un proceso en donde transformar el capital eh, today, geológico en capital social, it as a global, natural y conocimiento um, es posible. Con esto Being cierro able esta to sección produce, y le paso la palabra um, a Roberto Saludanski para que de las palabras te cierre. Muchas gracias y eh, por su tiempo y por su excelente intervención. So gracias, Valdo, por la invitación. Gracias, Osvaldo. Gracias, Osvaldo. Estoy saliendo bien la, la conexión. Uh, I'm testing if we can hear the connection. Um, we can hear baja. you a little bit low. Sí. ¿Se escucha ahora? Can you sí, hear me better presento. now? Yes, now we can hear you better. No. Nuevamente, gracias, Again, Osvaldo. Thank you very much, y Osvaldo. Lugar, And uh, first of all, las disculpas con I want to apologize for the technical glitches that we had earlier this morning. Conectividad, que son propios de well, estas nuevas connectivity problems are inherent to new experiences. A, a vivir We are forced to live in uh, virtuality, and therefore there comes technological problems. 
Unfortunately, we missed part of the conversation. We lost the beginning of this document uh, by Osvaldo. We, we missed the first part of uh, the presentation by Osvaldo. But we're going to make up for this. We're going to circulate the document. We're going to circulate it to all the participants and the ministries so that you can see the document that was used. And then on the other hand, we also have the recording. And this will be available in iShare site. We are also going to provide you with a proper link to access that recording. I want to say that this is the fourth uh, forum, this fourth mining and sustainable development forum. We started this together with the IDB and the IGV, GF, and together with CAM as well. It is truly a pleasure to be able to work with these other institutions I truly hope that the aim of this forum, which is bringing to the ministries information, opinions, and recommendations about um, mining and relevant topics related to mining, really, really serves its purpose. I want to thank Osvaldo and Annie Dupre, who were the ones who produced the basic document, the document that was used as a basis for discussion. I also want to thank the panelists, Annabel Marin, Anna Schittsberg from the US, Jose Miguel Benavente from Chile, and Rinaldo Mancin from Brazil. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your contributions. Your participation in this forum has been fundamental, and we thank you very much for your contributions. I also want to thank uh, IDB representatives, uh, Natasha Lacuna, and the representative from IGF, as well for being here, Marina Ruete. Thank you very much to you all. We're now closing this fourth Mining and Sustainable Development Forum of the Americas 2022. Thank you very much for your presence.